Hi, welcome to Ejuhan's first lesson for Matric 2020 on companies covering basic concepts and unique transactions. My name is Nadine Chetty Khan and I will be taking you through today's lecture. As mentioned, we'll be covering key concepts that you need to understand in order to work through examples for companies, as well as transactions that you will see come through in your exams. Now, firstly, as we break down some critical concepts that you need to understand and learn in order to understand questions going forward and successfully answer them. What is a public versus private company? A public company is listed on the J JC, which is the Johannesburg Stock Exchange, and which their shares are listed and can be freely traded amongst the public. A private company, on the other hand, is not listed, and therefore its holdings is held by a select few of individuals. How are you able to identify in a scenario whether the company is private or public is by the terminology LTD, which represents a public company, and PTYLTD, which represents a private company. Now, a Companies Act is a piece of legislation that has been put forth in South Africa and regulates companies, their incorporation, their management, the fiduciary duties of directors who manage the company, and other critical and special transactions like disposals of assets and mergers and acquisitions. Cypro represents the Company and Intellectual Property Commission. MOI stands for Memorandum of Incorporation and it's a piece of document that is basically the governing policy of a company. Income tax is the tax that you pay on profit that, and if this tax is then paid over to SARS. SARS is the South African Revenue Services and it's the government department to whom taxes must be paid. I'm sure you've heard of SARS. If you yourself are working and you have to pay over um, employees tax or PAYE by filling out a return every year or even if your parents mention it. Dividends is after-tax profit that has been approved to be shared amongst shareholders. Total dividends is made up of interim dividends, which is dividends that have been paid to shareholders during the financial year, as well as final dividends, which has been declared to shareholders at the end of the financial year. It need not necessarily be paid by the year end. Shares represent shareholders' investments in a company. So the number of shares a shareholder uh, owns will represent the percentage holding in the company. Earnings is a terminology used to represent after-tax profit that you will also know as net profit in your income statement. Shareholders are people who own the company through owning shares of the company. Now, what is limited liability? So, shareholders have limited liability, and what this means is that their liability to the company is limited to their initial investment. So, should the company go bankrupt, the most that the shareholders would lose is their initial investment. Their personal assets, such as their cars and their houses, are protected. The concept of separation of ownership from control, I've put there directors versus shareholders. Directors are appointed by shareholders to manage the company, whereas shareholders own the company via their shares in the company. As you can see, that there is a clear separation between who owns the company, being your shareholders, and who manages the company on behalf of the shareholders, who are your directors. Independent auditors, these are auditors that do not work for your company and some popular names like KPMG, PwC or Deloitte come to mind when thinking about independent auditors. Their 
key responsibility is to express an opinion on the financial statements of a company. Whereas an internal auditor is employed by a company and supervises the preparation of the financial statements. Retained income is after-tax profit that is not paid off as dividends to shareholders, but is instead kept or retained for future growth of the company. Authorized share capital represents the maximum number of shares that a company can sell. This is stated in the MOI or Memorandum of Incorporation. Whereas issued share capital is the actual number of shares sold to shareholders and is used to calculate dividends. The issued share capital at any point in time will not be higher than the authorized share capital number. The JSC, as mentioned previously, represents the Johannesburg Stock Exchange where public companies are listed and their shares can be traded by the public. I RS and GAAP represents the international financial reporting standards and generally accepted accounting practice that governs how accountants should prepare financial statements and report on accounting numbers in the financial statements. Now for our purposes, these are the key GAAP principles that we need to be aware of in order for us to answer questions in exams. The business entity rule basically is saying that the finances of the company are kept separate from that of the shareholders. Now, this is very important. Similarly, how there is a separation between ownership and, um, and management of the company, there is also a separation of the shareholders' finances to that of the company's. Because remember, the shareholders have an investment in the company, but the company's finances represent how, what their income, their expenses, their assets, equity, and liability that are completely separate from shareholders. Going concerns states that the financial statements need to be prepared with the understanding that the company will continue to operate in the future. So. All accounting transactions that are reflected in financial statements are under this assumption. We do not assume that the company is being liquidated or going into bankruptcy, but rather that they will continue to operate for the foreseeable future. Historical cost states that all assets are recorded at their original cost price. So for example, land and buildings are recorded at the price that you paid for them. The matching concept says that income and expenses must be recorded in the correct financial year. So income in the year that they're earned, expenses in the year that they're incurred. Materiality, all important items must be shown separately in the financial statements or when decisions must be made, separate accounts so, for example, it is worth having separate accounts for wages and salaries if you have more than two employees. In the scenario, if you have two employees, is it really material to have a separate wages and salaries account? One would argue no. So why must material items be shown separately in financial statements? It's because these items will be deemed very important for shareholders to have the information and understanding of these items. For example, what fees does directors earn from the company will be important to shareholders in order to assess are they being remunerated well enough for the performance of the company because remember they manage the company. If the company is doing well, they should be remunerated and, comp and compensated for that good performance. But if they are being excessively paid for a poor performing company, then the shareholders can see that being disclosed in the financial statements and take the right course of action to correct that issue. The concept of prudence says that figures using financial statements should be realistic. Okay. 
So the aim of this principle is to show the reality as it is and not make things prettier than what they are. So for example, you shouldn't inflate your assets, nor should you understate your liabilities. You should just show them for what it is. Now we'll be discussing the accounting cycle. And this will help you and guide you along how we actually go from doing transactions to journal entries to the general ledger to preparing your trial balance and then finally your financial statements. So on a daily basis, you'll be recording transactions on your source documents using invoices, receipts, EFT, debit notes, credit notes and any other source documents you may receive from third parties. You record these transactions in subsidiary journals such as CRJ, CPJ, DJ, Debtors Allowance Journal, Creditors Journal. Um, and these are the subsidiary journals that we've done before in grade 10 and in grade 11. <coughs> Excuse me. Thereafter, you post the journals to the ledgers, which is your general ledger, your debtors ledger, and your creditor ledger. And thereafter, you will then prepare a trial balance. So I say you are here where you'll be posting to the ledgers is where we'll be going on to in our next video lecture. So on an annual basis, then you prepare your pre-adjustment trial balance. You will do some necessary year end adjustments, which we'll be doing in a future lesson. You will prepare post adjustment trial balance, which will then be used to prepare your financial statements. So what your financial statements will include is your income statement, your cash flow statement, and your balance sheet. You will be closing and transferring and creating final accounts like your trading, your profit loss, and appropriation account, which we'll be also touching on in the next lesson. And you'll be preparing a post-closing trial balance. So Today, we are going to end off by focusing on two transactions that are really important in understanding companies. And the first one is issuing shares at no par value. Now, the concept of par value no longer exists. Initially, when shares were issued, that value was par value, but they become irrelevant. So as per the Companies Act, it says that a company does not have a par nominal value. Shares are now issued at a issue price. Now this value can be higher, lower, or same as the average share issue price. The average share issue price is calculated as the total net proceeds div divided by the number of shares in issue at the point in time of the calculation. So let's look at our first example, which is taken from the Western Cape Department of Education website. You are provided with information relating to ABC Limited, Limited LTD, meaning it is a public company, for the year ended 30th June 2003. Now remember that if the year ended 30th June 2003, that means the year financial year starts on 1st July 2002. The company has an authorized share capital of 500,000 shares and 60% of these shares were already issued by 1st July 2002. So this means that that represents the issued shares. Our required says for the issue of new shares on 31st December 2002, complete the table for account debited, account credited, and effect on the accounting equation. Prepare the note to the balance sheet for ordinary share capital at the end of the financial year and prepare the owner's equity section of the balance sheet on 30 June 2003, which is the year in. We have some additional information. So we have the following balances that appeared in the ledger. At the start of the year, we had ordinary share capital and retained income balances. And then we were given the retained income balance at the end of the year. 
On 31st December 2002, all the unissued shares were issued at the JSE at 7 Rand per share. So when you issue shares, you are going to debit bank because you are receiving money and you are going to credit ordinary share capital. The amount that it was calculated at, even though it was 7 Rand per share, it was a total amount that it will be the number of shares issued multiplied by the issue price. And that gives you a total of 1.4 million. Now, because bank is increasing as it being debited, you're going to increase assets. And as the account being credited is ordinary share capital, which is an owner's equity account, and it increases on the credit side, therefore we are also going to increase owner's equity. Liabilities is unaffected and therefore it's zero. So you can see number one, the effect on the accounting equations that assets and owner's equity increase by 1.4 million and the equation balances. Number two asked us to do the ordinary share capital note. So here what you would do is you generally number it some number. Here we put it note seven. And then you put the title called ordinary share capital. The note is giving you two pieces of important information. Authorized share capital and issued share capital. Now, authorized, remember the scenario told us that the number of authorized ordinary shares is 500,000 shares. That is what we are going to state under that title authorized to make it known to the financial users who one of them is the shareholders that the maximum number of shares that can be in issue is 500,000. Then we go and actually look at the issued shares and to see the movement in the issued shares from the beginning of the year to the end of the year. Now, the beginning of the year, we had 300,000 shares in issue for 1.5 million, which is the balance that was given to us. During the year, 200,000 shares were issued at 7 Rand per share, and that amounts to 1.4 million, as we did in number one. And when we add the opening balance to the movement for the year, you can see that 500,000 shares are in issue at year end with a total RAND value of 2.9 million. Now, as you can see that the issued amount of shares equaled the authorized amount of shares. So this company can no longer issue any more shares. And then number three, we had to show the shareholders equity section of the balance sheet. So first you need to start with the name of the company, which is ABC Limited, and then say that it's an extract from the balance sheet on 30th June 2003. You must state the year for the financial statements. Your title must be shown as shareholders equity and you must reference the notes. Now shareholders equity is made up of two equity items, ordinary share capital, which we link up to the note we did in number two, note number seven there, and then retain income. And we put a note number there as number eight, even though we didn't answer that note and create that note in one of the previous um, answers, we just have to put a number there. Ordinary share capital's balance is 2.9 million as we calculated in number two and retain income, the closing balance was given to us of 970,000. When you add those both up, shareholders equity balance must be put on the top in line with the titled shareholders equity of a total of 3.87 million. Now in this scenario, it never specified that we should do the comparative year, but generally in financial statements, you would do the current year and then the prior year should be 2002, 30th June. But because it didn't ask us and didn't specify it, we just did the current year. The second scenario transaction we're going to look at is buyback of shares. Now, Section 48 of the Company Act allows the company to buy back shares from shareholders subject to certain conditions. Our scenario, which is also taken from the Western Cape 
um, Department of Education's website says that you are provided with information relating to XYZ Limited for the year ended 30 June 2003. The company has an authorized share capital of 500,000 shares. 60% of these shares have already been issued by 1st July 2002. Similar um, scenario as the previous example. Required number one for the issue of new shares on 31st December 2002 and the repurchase of the shares on 31st March 2003 complete the table for account debited, account credited and the effect of the accounting equation. Then we must then prepare the following notes on the balance sheet, the ordinary share capital and retained income. We must prepare the owner's equity section of the balance sheet. And then we must show how the net issue of shares. Now, why net issue? Net issue means the issue of the shares minus the buyback. Because you are giving shares by issuing and by buying back, you're taking back. So they want the net issue of shares and the repurchase, which is a buyback of shares, the cash flow statement for the year in 30 June. Additional information that was given to us. So we were given some balances that appeared in the ledger. Opening balances. It's important that you look at the date to determine whether it's opening and closing balances. 1st June 2002 is the opening balance and 30th June 2003 closing balances. The only closing balances we have a loan from Ace Bank of 900000 We are given opening balances for ordinary share capital, retain income and the loan. And then Part B says on 31st December, all the unissued shares were issued at the JC market price of 7 gram per share. So remember we had 300,000 shares in issue at the start. 200,000 needs to be issued in order to make sure that all unissued shares are issued by 31st December. Now how did I get the difference? Well, you must take the authorized share capital, which is the maximum number of shares that can be issued, subtract what was already in issue to get how many that is an issued. It says that these new shares do not qualify for interim dividends. On 31st March 2003, the directors decided to repurchase 80,000 shares at 780 per share from the state of a shareholder who had died. This shareholder had originally purchased his shares in the JC at different times, various times, and at different prices over the past five years. D, the company made a pre-tax profit of 1.2 million, after tax profit of 8.4 million for the financial year. Interim dividends of 40 cents per share were paid on 31st December and final dividends were declared on the 30th June, which is end of the year, for 55 cents per share. Please be careful that here it's quoted in cents and not rands. Okay, so let's do number one. First, we can see we built on the accounting equation as a previous example with the issue of the shares for 1.4 million. Then on 31st March 2003, we did a buyback. Now when you do a buyback, it's very important that you understand that two accounts may be affected in your equity section. Okay. So let's look at the first part. Because you're buying back shares, you are paying the shareholders money to get those shares back. So therefore, you're going to credit bank, and that means decrease bank. Now, it's credited twice here because two equity accounts are affected. What that means is you are going to reduce your ordinary share capital which is the equity account that originally has the amounts when you issued shares. Okay, so whenever you issue shares, your ordinary share capital account increases. Now that you're buying back shares, you need to decrease it. But 
you will only decrease it by the value of the average issue price. If the share buyback price is greater than the average issue price of the shares, then that difference will be going to retain income. Okay, so let's work through the numbers to understand this. Let's calculate the average issue price of the shares on 31st March 2003. Remember, by 31st March 2003, all shares were issued, 500,000 shares, and the RAND value that we calculated in the previous example is 2.9 million. To get the average issue price of all those different shares that have been issued at different times, remember those shares were issued at different times at different prices. So we are calculating across those different shares what is the average issue price. We are going to take the 2.9 million divided by the 500,000 and then it will give you an average issue price of 5 rand 80 cents per share. Now, if you recall that the share buyback is at 7 rand 80. So the buyback price is greater than the average issue price. So this means you can only reduce ordinary share capital by the average issue price. So what you're going to do is you're going to take the 80,000 shares that were bought back, multiply it by the average issue price of 580, and that will give you a total of 464,000. You are then going to reduce ordinary share capital by that amount of 464,000 by debiting ordinary share capital and therefore owner's equity will be a negative 464,000. Step two, the difference between the share price, um, the, 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 issue, the share back by price of 780 and the average share price, which is 580, is 2 rand. That difference you are going to multiply by the number of shares you're buying back, which is 80,000, will give you a RAND value of 160,000. That amount you're not going to take out from ordinary share capital. Instead, you are going to debit retained income. And then you're going to reduce owner's equity by negative 160,000. So if you look in the owner's equity, the effect on the account equation, you can see there's two accounts that have been debited, ordinary share capital, then retained income, and the credit is bank. The reason being is that anything that's paid above your average issue price to buy back shares will be taken from profits that have been kept by the company. Okay, that's how they are going to fund that additional amount that's paid to the shareholders. Number three asked us to do an extract from the balance sheet on 30 June 2003. Now the required seems very simple, but there's a lot of calculations in order to build up the final totals for ordinary share capital and retain income. Again, you must mention the company's name and the title that it's an extract from the balance sheet on 30 June 2003. Put the title shareholders equity and then give the description of each component of shareholders equity. In our examples, ordinary share capital and retained income, which we've allocated note numbers for. Now let's discuss how we get to ordinary share capital. The opening balance was 1.5 million. And then on 31st December 2002, we issued shares to a value of 1.4 million. And then we did the share buyback, the average share price times the number of shares that were bought back, which was 80,000 shares, gave us a RAND value of 464,000, which needed to be subtracted from ordinary share capital. 
This gave us a final total of 2.436 million. Now, retail income had a few more calculations. So we are, we are going to take the, the share buyback into consideration, but as well as another transaction. So we start with the opening balance of 620,000. We subtracted the 160,000 that was related to the share buyback. How did we get to that? Remember, it was the difference between the share buy buyback price and the average share issue price, which is two rand being the difference, multiplied by 80,000 shares that were bought back. That gave us 160,000. To that, we add profit after tax, which is 840,000. And then we finally take out total dividends for the year to get to a closing balance for retained income. Now, remember from our definitions that total dividends is made up of interim plus final dividends. So let's go calculate each. Interim dividends, they told us that 300,000 shares were um, approved for interim dividend allocation. So meaning that the new shares that were in issue by that time, the 200,000 shares did not qualify for interim dividends. That meant that the opening balance of 300,000 shares were the only number of shares that qualified for interim dividends. This was despite the fact that the new shares were issued on the same date as the interim dividend was paid. So we are going to only take the 300,000 shares multiplied by 40 cents, which translates to 0 0.4 rands per share, to give us an interim total of 120,000. Final dividends is at year end. Remember that before the share buyback, there was 500,000 shares in issue, being the 300,000 as its opening balance, plus the 200,000 issued on 31st December, giving us the 500,000. You subtract the 80,000 shares that were bought back, because remember we are buying back those shares, so it reduces the number of shares in issue. And then we multiply that by the final dividend declared of 55 cents or 0 0.55 rands per share to give us a final dividend of 231,000. When you add the interim and final dividend, you get total dividends of 351,000. We subtract that. Now, the reason we subtract that from profits is because dividends is defined as the after-tax profits that are taken from the company and given to shareholders. So therefore, we have to take it out from the business profits. Now, just to come back to your dividends, if you want a formula to calculate dividends, it's going to be the number of shares in issue at that date multiplied by the dividend price. Now remember to convert that dividend price that is usually in cents to rands to get a rand final answer. Just like in this scenario, some shares, even if they may be an issue, may not qualify for dividends, like in the example interim dividends, so you must not consider them in the number of shares in issue. The scenario will be very clear for what shares must be excluded. That will give you a total of retained income of 949,000. As you can see, a simplified required, but to get to those final numbers requires a lot of thinking, a lot of calculations. Number four asked us to do the extract from the cash flow statements. Now, there's three transactions. Two of them were very transparent, very in your face, because there were transactions relating to them in the additional information. The third one we're going to discuss wasn't so clear. 
Now, in your financing activities, all three of these transactions fall under financing activities. The first one was the proceeds you received from issuing shares on 31st December, which amounted to 1.4 million and shown as a positive number because it's an inflow. The repurchase of shares, which is the sum of 160,000 and the 464,000, to give you a total of 624,000, was an outflow of money from the business because you used it to buy back shares from the company. You take the amount that you put in ordinary share capital and retain income. Because if you look back at the accounting equation, both of those accounting equations had bank as a credit. Now, the final one here is not so clear. And don't worry about it if you didn't pick it up at this point in time, because we are going to show you how to become more familiar to identify certain transactions where it is not explained in the scenario or there's no specific additional information relating to it. You have to pick it up just from looking at the numbers. In this example, a loan balance was given to you at the beginning and end of the year. And you had to see that the balance shifted so that with, there was an inflow of money. That means the loan increased. And the only way the loan can increase is if you borrow more money and more come, mo that money comes into your bank account increasing. Therefore, the difference is 500000 as an inflow. There was no additional information on the loan. There was nothing given to direct you to look at the balance except for the closing and opening balance. Like I said, don't stress on it. We'll become more familiar as we work through more examples that you can quickly pick it up. And these transactions are not very unique, so you'll be able to see them from each new example and exam paper you work through. Now, there's other journal um, company-specific transactions that we'll also look at. Other than dividends and loans, it will be director's fees, audit fees and taxes, and we'll be working through those as going forward. I hope this lesson was as useful to you as it was to every other student that I've worked through with this question. I hope it explains the fundamentals to you, and I look forward to you joining our lectures in future. Thank you, and that's all from us at Eduhans today.